I'm Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, big tech and the tax overhaul. How will Washington plan for the sector's offshore profits impact Silicon Valley? We'll discuss potential scenarios if the bill becomes law. Plus, a Bloomberg exclusive, Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong offers his take on Bitcoin, which continued its spike this week. How the online platform has nearly tripled its user base since it's picked up the cryptocurrency. And as big tech races to control your living room, we'll hear from the brain behind Amazon's Alexa. First to our lead. After Senate Republicans passed their version of tax reform here in the U.S., we spent this week exploring the ways the proposed legislation could affect the tech industry. Take a listen. It was a round of applause on Capitol Hill for GOP senators as they passed their version of a tax bill. Is passed. Pushing the Trump administration closer to its first piece of signature legislation. If they send it to my desk, I promise all of the people in this room, my friends, so many friends in this room, it's a great state, I promise you I will sign it. I promise. I will not veto that bill. Tech companies have spent big to make sure their interests are heard. Big Tech stands to benefit from the legislation in a few ways. First, the latest bill would slash the corporate rate from 35 to 20 percent. Although, according to Goldman Sachs, the tech sector already benefits from a 24 percent effective rate. Then there's the hordes of cash stockpiled overseas. Big Tech stands to benefit with this new tax legislation, which lets them defer taxes on foreign earnings until they bring them back to the U.S. at rates of 7.5 to 14.5 percent, down from the current 35 percent. We get this passed, which I really believe we will. I think we have to as a country. It's going to bring back, I would say, $4 trillion back into this country, which right now cannot come back. In our view, it should be a deemed repatriation. This means it should be a required tax. And so you're not asking the people uh, that have had earnings from their international uh, subsidiaries if they'd like to bring back money. The current bill would make it a voluntary repatriation. Though the question stands whether bringing back this offshore money will go into anything other than buybacks or M&A. Lastly, telecom firms could win big if enhanced deduction for the capital expenditures make it into the final bill, theoretically allowing them to upgrade the fiber backbone of the nation. For now, though, the waiting game goes on until a final bill hits the president's desk. As you just saw, the Trump administration wants tech companies to bring back their overseas stockpiles of cash, in turn keeping companies like Apple from fleeing tax havens like Ireland, where Apple just reached a deal over $15.4 billion in unpaid taxes to pay those back. Bloomberg Gadfly columnist Shira Ovide joins us now. So let's start with the actual rate. It's a lower effective rate, but the effective rate is already fairly low. How much of an impact is this going to have? I mean, look, every business wants lower taxes. I think that's been clear in all of the debate about the tax legislation this year, that companies in tech and outside of tech are very happy to have a lower tax rate, even as, as you said, a lot of these companies are not paying the 35% statutory rate because of tax breaks and other reasons. So what about repatriation? How much money is this actually going to bring back? Four trillion dollars, as Donald Trump says? Yeah, I'm not sure where he got the four <laughs> trillion number. I mean, look, there are several trillion dollars of, of companies, uh, company money parked offshore that are considered permanently reinvested and therefore not taxed at 35%. Mm. But you've seen ways that companies like Apple have basically done stealth repatriation, right? So Apple has $250 billion or so parked overseas, but they've also borrowed $100 billion in the last few years to do things like buying back their shares, issuing dividends, things like that. And you can look at that as a way to repatriate money without paying the tax, which is kind of what Apple uh, might be able to do under this proposed legislation. Now, there had been concern about stock option legislation yeah. that was not in the House bill. It was dropped from the Senate bill. So where are we with that? Right. It looks like, I mean, the, it was basically the startup community's worst nightmare that you saw venture capitalists like Fred Wilson from Union Square basically speak out and said, look, there was a version of this both in the Senate and the House bill for a while that looked like it was going to uh, force uh, 
startup employees to pay taxes on stock options and restricted stock essentially immediately, mm -hmm. even before they were able to sell those shares. Mm -hmm. And that certainly would have put an undue burden on a lot of uh, corporate workers here in Silicon Valley. So what do you make of the deal that Apple has made with Ireland? And it, they've come to terms on a, an agreement uh, on the terms of an escrow fund to pay back these taxes that are they say they owe. Look, I mean, th this dispute over uh, Irish taxes with Apple is going to carry on for many, many more months. Mm -hmm. Uh, so basically, if you remember last year, right, the EU antitrust authorities said to Ireland, you've improperly given Apple a tax break that has allowed the company to avoid something like $15 billion worth of taxes over the years, and you have to go get that back, Ireland, from Apple. And there's basically a dispute about what to do with that $15 billion while Apple, Ireland, and the EU fight about that money. So how do you expect this to play out? It's going to be in litigation for a long time. And look, even if Apple has to pay $15 billion, oddly for a company of Apple's scale, it's not such a big burden. That was Bloomberg Gadfly columnist Shira Oviday. Well, this week, prominent tech investor Shervin Pishavar, who's been accused of sexual misconduct, said he is taking a leave of absence from his duties at venture capital firm Sherpa Capital and transportation company Virgin Hyperloop One. Five women who met Pishavar in a professional context told Bloomberg they were sexually assaulted or harassed by him. Current and former colleagues of a sixth woman, Uber employee Austin Geit, say he groped her at an Uber holiday party. Pishavar has sued the Definers, a research firm founded by Republicans, for spreading false information about him. The Definers has responded to his suit, saying they have nothing to do with his accusations and the suit should be dismissed. In a statement, Pishavar wrote, as the legal case progresses, it is my priority to ensure the Sherpa Capital family is not adversely affected. I am confident I will be vindicated. This week, Google won dismissal of a California class action lawsuit alleging the company systematically paid male employees more than females. San Francisco Superior Court Judge Mary Wiss wrote, this class definition does not purport to distinguish between female employees who may have valid claims against Google based upon its alleged conduct from those who do not. She allowed the women to file an amended complaint. The new complaint will make clear that Google violates the California Equal Pay Act by paying women less than men for substantially equal work. Coming up, just days away from its CBOE debut, Bitcoin kept climbing this week. How Bitcoin futures could impact online tr the online trading platform Coinbase, that is next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Bitcoin continued to climb this week. The largest cryptocurrency by market value was selling for less than $1,000 at the start of the year. In recent days, several exchanges have come out with news on offering Bitcoin futures. We caught up with Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong on Wednesday. Coinbase is an online platform that allows users to buy or sell Bitcoin by connecting with their bank accounts. It has almost tripled its user base this past year, now standing at 13 million accounts. Well, there's certainly been this big influx of new interest in digital currency. Part of that has been driven by institutional money uh, getting really interested in the space. So we've seen uh, most of the large derivatives exchanges out there, CME, a number of others, starting to say they're going to list Bitcoin futures. And so um, that's driven a lot of interest. It's a big signal that traditional financial institutions are now starting to move into digital currency. What is the CBOE, CME, NASDAQ, them trading these contracts? What does that mean for you? Does that create new challenges? Well, number one, it's just a big endorsement of the digital currency space, as this is a real asset class that more and more players are going to trade. But I think for us specifically what it means is that um, we offer spot market data to a number of these providers or we're discussing it with them. Uh, we run the largest institutional exchange in the United States called GDAX for digital currency. Um, the other thing is that we are offering a custodian product where a lot of institutional investors need a secure way to store digital currency on behalf of their LPs and their clients. And so uh, we launched a, a product recently on that for Coinbase custody. So those are the ways that it might influence our business. Are you at all worried, though, that your clients might decide to go work with traditional mainstream Wall Street companies <laughs> rather than Coinbase? 
Well, I mean, I think it's certainly an option. Like, there's going to be more and more people involved in the digital currency space. Like, we're not going to be the only ones. And so I think that's a good thing. Like, there's just going to be a diversity of players out there. There's going to be a lot of winners. But digital currency is moving so fast that I do think a company dedicated to it with 200 people who've built up this industry knowledge over the last five years is going to have a sustainable competitive advantage. Now, we have to talk about customer service. You've been experiencing a glitch, as you have with prior surges. Why does this happen? Yeah, well, I mean, it's in a word, it's hyper growth, right? Uh, we've hired from about 40 customer support agents to about uh, 220 or so this year. And I think by the end of next year, we'll have another 400 or so. And so we're- In addition to the 200 that you already have? Yeah, so, and we also launched phone support this year. So we are going through this period of growth that is almost never seen in business. Um, you know, it's really difficult, to be honest, to keep up with uh, this amount of demand. And I, we're not servicing our customers to the level that they deserve at the moment. Um, so that's really frustrating to see, but it's my job from the top to ensure that we're going to get there. But can you explain a little bit more about why it happens? Like, is it a glitch? Yeah. Is it a crash? What's actually happening technically? Oh, no. I mean, it's just a huge influx of new customers. Um, so, you know, our volumes, whether you look at it as uh, trading volume, new signups, everything, it's gone about 8x since June of this year, um, which is just unheard of. So it's really difficult to plan for that kind of capacity. So it's literally that you don't have enough humans behind the scenes to receive all of these complaints? Correct. So you know, in addition to hiring new people, is there anything else that you can do? Mm, I mean, certainly we can always improve the product, right? I mean, improving the product is a way to reduce the number of customer support tickets that are coming inbound. So, you know, the team is working really hard on that. I, the kind of key metrics we look at are around, you know, uptime, NPS score, average time to customer response. Those are the core metrics we're looking at to ensure that we're meeting our customer uh, demands at this time. Do you have any concerns that this will decrease trust among your customers? Is that new customers, you'll lose new customers as a result of this? Um, you know, honestly, I do have that fear, yeah. I think that it's really difficult to go through a period of this rapid growth and maintain the same level of service. Um, and we've been watching those metrics and, and they're not where we want them to be. So, um, you know, growth is a really high quality problem to have, but it doesn't mean it's not a big problem. And I think especially in financial services, we're held to a much higher bar than say like the Twitter fail whale or something like that. I mean, we're storing people's money and I think people are right to call us to a higher standard. The IRS has been asking for more information about your holdings and your profits. What are you hearing from your clients about mm. this? Yeah, well, the IRS sent us a subpoena for a large number of customer records, in fact, all customer records, um, over a several year period, which was pretty unprecedented. And so we did push back on that really strongly. We, we took it to court. Um, the, the judge, uh, you know, I think gave us a big vote of confidence and they reduced the scope of the, the IRS request by 97%. It wasn't down to zero, which is where we think it should have been for something that broad, but it was certainly a partial victory. Now, I think if you look long term, um, look, we want to help people pay all their taxes on digital currency gains. Th what I think this should look like is something kind of like Fidelity or Charles Schwab where everybody gets 1099 statements, you get, the IRS gets a copy, our customers get a copy. It should be that simple. Um, we're working with the IRS now, thankfully, to make sure that we come up with some kind of a solution where everyone's going to pay their taxes. But um, this is one of those new areas. Technology keeps finding a new box that doesn't fit into the existing framework quite perfectly. And we need to work with everybody out there to make sure we get there. Given the uncertainty currently, as you work this out, are you giving any advice to your clients about how to report their gains to the IRS? So, you know, obviously we try to stay away from any sort of tax advice um, since that's not what we do. Um, but we do provide a report to our customers, a cost basis report that they can export and send to their accountant. So that's the solution we have in the interim until there's something like 1099s or, or 1099s themselves. Let's talk about what's happening with some of these other cryptocurrencies, Ethereum and Litecoin. You can trade on Coinbase. What do you see happening with Ethereum versus Bitcoin in the future? Mm. Well, they've sort of evolved down different paths. Um, you know, Bitcoin used to be 95% of all the market cap of digital currency, and it's come down quite a bit. I think something maybe to 50 or 60%. And so uh, Bitcoin is ending up, in my mind, being a little bit more like 
digital gold, if you will. It's, it's kind of the oldest digital currency. It's, a time, it's the one that people, people flee to in times of uncertainty. But it hasn't scaled to become, for example, a payment network with the sort of transaction throughput that people might want. So um, Ethereum has kind of grown to do that. And Ethereum is now doing more transactions per day than Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum also has this really innovative new concept of smart contracts. And so it's much more programmable than Bitcoin. Bitcoin you could think of as a simple four function calculator. You can send A to B or subtract B to A. Um, Ethereum is almost like a, a programming language where you could write any software and run it on this globally decentralized computer. So that's kind of a mind-bending concept, but um, let's just say that Ethereum is higher throughput per second as a transaction network, and it's much more programmable. You have launched a new app called Toshi, which yeah. seems sort of like an app store for Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Explain what you're trying to do here. Yeah. Well, the analogy I like to use is of the internet. So when the internet started, you had TCP IP and Usenet, and it was really difficult to use. And then a browser came out on top of the internet with Netscape, and it made it easy for anybody to build an app and also uh, access the internet. So we're doing the same thing with Toshi. Toshi is, you could think of it as a browser for the Ethereum network. Um, and we're trying to make it really easy for any developer to build an app and any consumer to actually use applications on the Ethereum network. And honestly, we're a little bit inspired by things like WeChat and in India, or sorry, in China and Paytm in India, uh, even M-Pesa in Kenya. Like mobile money is a really big deal, especially outside the United States. And I think that people in emerging markets could actually use digital currency to start to get access to financial services through something like Toshi. So when it comes to the price, how do you see Bitcoin versus Ethereum playing out? I mean, do you, A, do you see the Bitcoin spike continuing? Do you see Ethereum surpassing Bitcoin as some have suggested it will? Yeah. Well, of course, I never want to be giving any investment advice, but I mean, just in broad strokes, the way I think of it is that um, Bitcoin does have a certain amount of guaranteed scarcity built in. There's only ever going to be 21 million coins. And if, of course, if something's more scarce, the price can be driven up. Mm -hmm. um, Ethereum has taken a, a different approach, which is that there may be a moderate inflation curve, almost like the US dollar, if they might target 2 to 3% inflation a year. They're actually still deciding exactly what it's going to be. So it's not. Ethereum's not trying to be gold, which is what Bitcoin is. It's trying to be something more like um, a payment network or something more programmable. So that all factors into what the price will be. I guess one other really broad thing you could look at is just where are the users going? You know, and where are the developers building the new apps? I personally see more developers building apps on top of Ethereum today. Um, so that's one other factor which could point to what it might be in the future. We talk about this a lot on Bloomberg, whether, you know, is Bitcoin a fraud, is it not? Are we in a bubble, are we not? If it's not a fraud, is it a bubble? What do you think? <laughs> Well, I mean, I certainly don't think it's a fraud. I mean, um, if, is it a bubble? Maybe. I mean, digital currency has gone through a number of these periods where there's a big run up and then it'll correct back. But you add a new plateau each time it goes up and it kind of comes back a little bit. So I think we're going through the most recent run up period. It's probably the fourth one we've been through as a company. Um, and I would expect it to correct back at some point, but continue over time in an upward channel. There's an update to the Bitcoin network called SegWit, which would speed up transactions. You guys haven't implemented that yet. Do you plan to and when? Um, yeah, it is one of the things we're looking at adding. Um, it's probably not in the top five next things that our customers are requesting. What but are the top five next things? <laughs> people want uh, more assets on the platform. They want a better uh, experience, meaning like identity verification, higher limits, um, the sign up onboarding experience. And then they're asking for these new products, uh, like our institutional customers are asking for a custodian product. Um, you know, people are looking at a way to just trade more assets, have a better experience, and store it securely. That's Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong. Coming up, Broadcom posts fourth quarter numbers that beat across the board as it tries to pull off the biggest takeover in tech history. This is Bloomberg. Google is ramping up for a hiring spree. The company is recruiting thousands of reviewers to reduce the number of inappropriate videos on YouTube. It's also introducing tougher restrictions on advertising and making greater use of smart technology. And by 2018, Google aims to have more than 10,000 people to review questionable videos on the platform. The announcement comes as YouTube looks to bounce back from a string of embarrassing incidents of questionable content that's been discovered on its site. 
Now on the earnings front, Broadcom beat across the board in the fourth quarter and gave an upbeat sales forecast, indicating that its smartphone customers are optimistic about demand. This as the chipmaker attempts to pull off the biggest tech deal ever with an acquisition of Qualcomm. Our Bloomberg editor at large, Corey Johnson, joined us with more. Broadcom is a really interesting business because they have gobbled up lots of different parts. You know, you mentioned Qualcomm as potential acquisition, but they've already gobbled up some really interesting and big parts of the semiconductor world. Uh, Avago buying Broadcom, uh, Avago having great success in the iPhone, Broadcom having success in the iPhone and in networking devices. Brocade, we were just talking about someone who worked at Brocade who got acquired by Broadcom. That company uh, also uh, dominant in the in the storage business. But the results that we see here today from Broadcom looking back into the quarter that ended in October, really strong iPhone business here. What we see here is really great strength in gathering more and more silicon in not this old iPhone, but in the new iPhones. And we see that business really showing up in these results. 17% year over year growth in the semiconductor space is very strong, very, very strong for businesses big. We've seen the danger of relying on Apple as a customer. How much does Broadcom rely on Apple as a customer as opposed to other it customers? It is absolutely the most important customer. And, and you know, looking forward to the Qualcomm M&A, Broadcom's been successful getting Apple to pay it. Qualcomm has been unsuccessful in getting Apple to pay it. Uh, Qualcomm has been unsuccessful getting Apple to add more real estate in the phone. Uh, Broadcom has been able to add more real estate in the phone. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, the quality of the phone calls that Apple likes to boast about, you remember how crummy the phone was when it first came out? I uh, not, it wasn't just that the service was bad, it was that actually hearing the calls was more and more difficult. Uh, Broadcom's got a great chip that helps, uh, it sits at the bottom of the radio chip and helps uh, understand, helps us to listen to a little bit better those signals that come in through the phone and understand what we are saying to the phone. It helps power Siri. Uh, those kinds of chips are so important to Apple and they're relying on Broadcom. And you can see those sales in this quarter. But what we don't know about yet, and we're going to start to learn any second now as the conference call goes in, is how successful they've been uh, selling into routers selling into servers and selling, you know, think of the companies and technology that are really, really struggling now. Uh, Meg Whitman's Hewlett Packard uh, having horrible problems. Uh, a Cisco just barely coming out of a turnaround having trouble selling hardware. Oracle's Sun business struggling. Uh, uh, the IBM hardware business having a really hard time. Yet we see this growth in, in, in uh, Amazon Web Services, in Microsoft Azure, in Google's uh, uh, nascent efforts uh, in the cloud. Uh, what we see there is that they might be buying chips from Broadcom itself, not going to Hewlett Packard, not going to IBM to buy hardware, but buying the chips from Broadcom, building their own devices. That's what I want to hear about in the conference call that's going on right now is what kind of success are they having uh, selling into the white box manufacturers at Amazon, at uh, Microsoft, and at uh, Apple and at Facebook? What kind of update, if any, are we going to get? Get on the progress of this potential takeover. Well, I think you know this is a, a lot of swimming upstream for Broadcom right here. I think the uh, the thing that they could do to really help sway the market right now to convince them this deal is going to happen is to talk about financing and talk about how they can afford this. The financial guidance they just put out in this uh, in this earnings release again the call is just beginning right now. The guidance is 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 nebulous. It's hey in the future we're going to see margins go from 60 to 65 percent. We're going to see increased free, free cash flow as a percentage of net income. We're going to have a much financially stronger business going forward. They're not putting dates on it, but they're telling us that this business is going to get a lot, go from really good to really great. I don't know if we believe them or not. They don't have a history of missing targets. Right, and it's more typical to have a time frame, right? Uh, it is typical of companies when they give very specific financial guidance to give us a, a time frame for that guidance, or at least a year out or two years out. They're saying eventually. But nonetheless, I think it's, it, it does suggest that they really see great things for this business and, and would give them the kind of financial leverage to uh, do an acquisition and borrow a lot of money to do so. Bloomberg's Corey Johnson there. Still ahead, the brain behind Amazon's Alexa, our exclusive conversation with Rohit Prasad ahead. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. 
In 2014, Amazon introduced the Echo, a new category of device designed around your voice. The Echo and Alexa with it was initially only available to invited Amazon Prime members. That all changed in June 2015 when both the Echo and Alexa were introduced to the general public, bringing AI into our living rooms and sparking competition between tech titans. We caught up with Amazon Vice President and Head Scientist at Alexa, Rohit Prasad, for an exclusive interview. The set of skills will continue to improve daily convenience as we know it. As you can see, uh, everything is changing in terms of the behaviors of how we interact with Alexa. You set your alarms and timers through Alexa. You listen to your music through Alexa. You control your smart devices through Alexa. Uh, next, what you'll find that we are uh, transforming from more natural transactions to more deep conversations. Uh, if you look at this, we have been working on, uh, with, together with universities, what we call the Alexa Price Competition, where the goal is to build social bots that can talk to you for 20 minutes in coherent and engaging fashion. This is incredibly hard. Even for, as a human in a, uh, in a party, at a party where you have to talk to a stranger, 20 minutes is a very hard barrier to beat. So are you focused then on making Alexa more human-like and more conversational? Absolutely, we are focused on making Alexa smarter every day and human-like as well. Uh, from that perspective, we are looking into how Alexa can understand many different types of context. One of the common contexts that is human-like, that humans, we as humans are able to do quite well, is how we carry information from the previous turn. So if I said, play uh, what's the first album from Adele and then play it, uh, then you know the reference is the first album from Adele. Uh, similarly, context comes in various forms in terms of geographical and, uh, and regional context. If you're saying, uh, when are the Spurs playing next? Uh, we mean Spurs in, uh, in the US, it will mean the San Antonio Spurs, whereas in UK, it will mean the soccer uh, team Tottenham uh, Spurs. So these are the s some ways we are already making Alexa smarter, and this will just keep getting better and better. What trends are you seeing in how customers are using this to shop, and, and what are you doing to encourage them to shop more, aside from simply discounts? Alexa is about improving daily convenience. Uh, as part of everything we are doing to improve daily convenience, uh, shopping is, of course, an important aspect, but it's not the only aspect. Uh, one of the things uh, as our tenant in general is to reduce friction or, uh, or to make uh, interactions as seamless as possible with Alexa. So where we are seeing uh, uh, that happen very well, if you are trying to buy uh, the daily consumables or in terms of, uh, like if you said Alexa, reorder batteries or Alexa order batteries, those are working very seamlessly. And, and now with, uh, uh, with devices like Echo Show, uh, we are also making it possible for you to look at what you're buying. And if you said, Alexa, buy a blue shirt, you can see the blue shirt on the screen, uh, multiple options that are available, and then browse just by voice or select by just by voice, which makes it seamless to also buy things uh, and making it easier when you're looking at stuff that needs to be on the screen for you to make the decision. I'm curious about privacy. What information is Alexa collecting and keeping and then allowing developers to access? So privacy is, first of all, very important to us. Our uh, entire tenet is based on being very transparent with our customers. Uh, so in terms of, I would start with first, if you uh, look at how the interactions happen with Alexa, uh, Alexa only listens for the wake word on the device, nothing else. It's looking for that particular snippet of what you said, which sounds like Alexa. And then uh, only when it's confident that an, uh, a wake word was spoken, uh, then it starts streaming to the cloud. And you'll see with clear visual indicators that uh, on an Echo, for instance, the light ring comes on. On an Echo show, you see a light bar uh, with blue ring uh, around it on the screen, which makes it very transparent. What we've also made clear is that uh, customers can go to their application uh, in the companion application that is on your smartphone or through available through your web interface. You can go and look at every utterance that uh, you've spoken 
spoken to Alexa, uh, that's been recorded in our cloud services, uh, and then you can choose to delete them or delete all of them uh, is, is an option for you. And the reason those uh, that audio data is collected is for, uh, for making our services better for you, the customers. I'm curious about partnerships. You have a partnership with Microsoft. What can you tell us about the potential for more partnerships? Uh, when we spoke to Tony Reid, who also works on Alexa, she said anything's possible when it comes to uh, a partnership with Apple or even Google, for example. As Tony spoke to you before, uh, we are very open to partnering. Uh, we know we, uh, that our customers would want different choices. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, our partnership with Microsoft, we are making it uh, easy for Microsoft uh, customers who use Cortana to talk to Alexa and vice versa. So we are very open to uh, this kind of partnership because we want the best experiences for our customers. And how do you view the competitive landscape? Because you know some people are you know ha having rave reviews about Google Home. The HomePod from Apple is coming out next year, um, and it's getting more crowded. Yeah, I think it's great that uh, so many people and companies are interested in this space. I think that's great for our customers. Uh, but at Amazon, we view we are very customer centric, and we work back from our customer needs. Uh, we have been privileged to have uh, um, millions and millions of customers using Alexa every day. Uh, that has given us uh, clear needs that we need to solve for our customers, so we are focused on that. Uh, I'd also point out that uh, uh, we are essentially a voice first uh, as interaction paradigm, and that's where our focus is. And our mission is to get Alexa everywhere, uh, in homes, in cars, in, on the go, and now even in, uh, in workplace. Amazon Vice President and Head Scientist at Alexa, Rohit Prasad there. Well, WeWork doesn't appear to be scared of any potential downturns from Brexit. The office sharing startup is set to become London's largest private renter of offices. This according to data compiled by CoStar for Bloomberg. WeWork currently operates 17 London facilities. Two more will open soon and it has announced expansion plans at 10 additional locations there. It's also in talks to buy a 12 building campus near Liverpool Street Station for over $800 million. And Facebook will increase the size of its staff in the UK by 50%. The company is hiring 800 employees in London, predominantly in engineering roles. Facebook is under increasing scrutiny from British lawmakers. They're concerned about Russian interference in UK politics via social networks. And still ahead, Autodesk shares have collapsed. We sit down with the CEO for an exclusive interview. Plus, Airbnb wants to be the top destination for sustainable travel. A top exec joins us on their strategy ahead. Next, this is Bloomberg. A European Union court has sided with Apple in a trademark dispute with Chinese smartphone maker Xiaomi. Judges ruled that Xiaomi's Mi Pad could easily be confused with the U.S. tech giant's iPad. Xiaomi applied to get the EU trademark in 2014. It can appeal this decision one final time in the EU's top court. Well, the United Nations designated 2017 as the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development, and Airbnb is using the UN's guidelines to showcase its potential as a top sustainable option. We sat down with Chris Lahane, who heads Airbnb's Global Policy and Public Affairs, and began by looking at the company's growth. What's really, really interesting is we're seeing major travel in what has traditionally been called the flyover areas and also in emerging economies. But you look at our recent report, it shows almost over 250% growth in places like Indianapolis, Indiana. And I think what that really speaks to is the network effect of the platform as it spreads out and more and more people use it. But those are also places that have traditionally been a little bit underserved in terms of the traditional accommodation options. Hard for those hotels to justify build out there. And when you have things like the Indianapolis 500 or Big Ten football, the Big Ten football championship was in Indy last week, you, know, you see our platform just sort of spring to life. You're also expanding in Asia, in Africa, in the Pacific. Yeah. What's been the biggest challenge? 
I think, you know, for us, it's just, you know, the pace of the growth, right? I mean, that's, that's a high class challenge, by the way. I and mean, we just had our best quarter we've ever had over 260 million people now on the platform. Um, but, you know, this growth is just taking place underneath us. And for us, it's, you know, incredibly important that we make sure, you know, it's working as well as possible for our guests and our hosts, because ultimately, over 60% of the people who use Airbnb do so based on the recommendation of a friend or family member. And I just came back from Jamaica, tough travel, I realize. But it was the, the UN had a conference on inclusive travel, how you can use travel as it becomes a bigger and bigger part of the global economy, 10% and growing pretty fast. How can you make sure that everyone is benefiting from it? Um, and, and from a sustainability perspective and from an economic inequality perspective. And so a big part of what we talked about was by 2030, almost 60% of all travel is going to be taking place in these emerging markets. And how can we begin to do things now to make sure that entire communities are benefiting from it? And I think folks see us given that we're making travel available and accessible to traditionally non-traditional areas where people travel to um, as part of that solution. So it was really exciting, but it's an interesting thing to be having a conversation with right now at the front end of this whole trend. Any insight into whether Trump's policies on immigration is impacting international tourism? It's a great question. Um, I will say we haven't seen that yet. Now, you know, we've been out front in terms of opposing uh, the travel ban. Um, we actually had a whole campaign called We Accept, uh, which was really built around that. We haven't seen that in terms of actual travel and tourism. I do think it has profound impacts on, on the U.S. And I think where you potentially see that is, you know, does the U.S. brand, you know, as the home of the Statue of Liberty, right, does that take a hit as a result of that and then as, as a derivative of that, uh, you know, travel and tourism? I think it's growing so fast. I'm not sure that's going to be the case. But you do see the reverse of it in the following way, which is when I was in Jamaica, I had a number of countries that came up and wanted to talk to us about how we could work with them to make our data accessible, anonymized, to help inform their marketing because they themselves are actually looking to diversify their travel, where they're inbound, where people are traveling from to go visit their countries. And they specifically were concerned about becoming overly dependent on the U.S for travelers and wanting to diversify. And I think that is really being driven by some concerns about issues that are taking place over here in terms of how welcoming the U.S. is perceived to be. You worked in the Clinton administration. <laughs> I'm an old guy. <laughs> we recently covered uh, sexual misconduct of Shervin Pishavar, an investor in Airbnb, mm -hmm. also a major Democratic Party donor, did yeah. give money to Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. What's your response to these allegations? I think we believe what the women have said out there. Um, I think we've gone through a, and I think it's been a long time coming, and it was very much needed, you know, a pretty significant transition in the world, uh, particularly in this country, uh, in terms of people being willing to speak up and stand up uh, on an issue that's been taking place for, for forever. Um, and I just, I mean, every day you read these stories, and I just incredibly impacted by the courage of some of these victims, these women to stand up and, and talk about these these issues. Uh, and so obviously, you know, it's not particularly hard to say. We condemn any of that type of activity. I certainly uh, believe what, what the women are saying out there, but I think, you know, even more broadly, you know, do see that we're now in the middle of a pretty significant transition um, in what social mores are and how people look at these and how people accept it, um, how the press covers it, um, how willing people are to talk about it uh, and engage on it. Um, and that's incredibly important if we're actually going to be able to address the underlying substantive challenges. That was Chris Lehane, head of Airbnb's Global Policy and Public Affairs. Autodesk shares tumbled off its fourth quarter report back in November. The company has hit a rough patch with announced layoffs and slumping subscriptions. Our Bloomberg editor at large, Corey Johnson, sat down with Autodesk CEO Andrew Anagnost for an exclusive interview. There are several markets that are core to us. Obviously, the architecture, engineering market. Which has been which, the history of all of this. That, that's the history. We're also a big player in the product design and manufacturing space. What's becoming a super important emerging market is construction. You know, we've always been big in the A and E in AEC. Right. We're becoming very big in the C in AEC because that whole industry is digitizing. Well, and, it, and it's also interesting that, that in the procurement, you see uh, a, a lot of municipalities figuring out that if you work in procurement and design into the actual design process, you end up with a lot faster and a lot cheaper projects. Yeah, well, it, it's even, actually, Corey, it's even more, more, more than that. What's happening in construction is it's industrializing. 
construction processes are starting to look a lot more like manufacturing processes. And you know how digital manufacturing processes are. Yeah. Construction's got to be exactly the same. So you guys are in the midst of this, you announced these big changes in the business model, or, or the, the particularly the move from, from man, uh, uh, maintenance uh, to subscription, yep. and, and how that's maybe a little bumpier than you would have thought. Uh, stock took a big hit last week, though in, in context, of about two years, you're still about 72% for, for a two year stretch, which is a pretty good run. Yeah, it's a great run. And you know, Corey, we, we announced great results because we, we hit all our goals, we, we exceeded a few. 5% sales growth year over year. Yeah, well, 25% recurring revenue growth. We are returned to revenue growth. So remember, we, we were you know, going through the dip, so we were right. negative for a while, now we've returned to revenue growth. We, we did exactly what we were said we were going to do. I just think people expected us to maybe do a little well, bit more. Why would a customer switch from maintenance to a subscription-based uh, uh, fee for your service as opposed to just abandon it and go somewhere else? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you, you probably talk to a lot of these companies all the time. Most of our customers are seeing companies like Salesforce, Workday, they got Office 360. The way they buy software now is subscription-based. It's kind of just the expectation. They like it, they can turn it on, turn it off when they need it. Most customers are saying, yeah, this is the way the software industry is going. So there's really not a lot of resistance, maybe from the smallest customers in our base, but not from the bigger ones. So I talked to a lot of people uh, getting ready to talk to you today about sort of what was going on and what they thought of the call last week, what the information was. And one of the, I kept hearing questions about the timing of the restructuring. Yeah. Why do the restructuring now? And what does it have to do with your long-term 2020 free cash flow goals? Yeah, it was interesting con conspiracy theories that were being created. There were a lot out there. Well, yeah, yeah. well you know, it's... Uh, it's and, I'm, and I'm a collector of conspiracy theories. I'm a big fan. Yeah, and, and that, that was, there was a lot of ones around that. So, you know, one of the things, you know, you know, there's that famous John F. Kennedy quote, right? The best time to fix your roof is when the sun is shining. Right. That's exactly what we've been doing. We've been planning this for a while. We knew we needed to invest, invest more strategically in digitizing the company, and in particular in construction. The money just wasn't in the places we needed it. So this is something we planned. We're going to invest every penny back in the company over the next six to 12 months. So this, this isn't a reduction in our OPEX envelope. It's just a reshuffling of where we're spending the money. So what does that mean for headcount? Is headcount going to end up the same here? We'll be, as, headcount wise, we'll be as big a company a year from now as we, we were before the restructure. So where, where do those resources have to be? Where were they maybe in the wrong place and where are they going to be now? Well, what we did is we had a bunch of initiatives that weren't core to what we were trying to do. You know, driving the subscription transition, digitizing the company, becoming a super modern digital company, reimagining construction and manufacturing. We had projects that just weren't aligned with that. So we, we essentially took out entire projects and we're shifting the money over to those things that are important. I think the other thing that, that I heard back a lot was that uh, there's a concern over the subscription number, just how many uh, customers are, are joining the subscription service. Talk to me about uh, you know what what the what the story is there, what you expect it to be. You know, I now. think that was the biggest piece of turbulence from last right. week because we delivered a solid result on the core, which is sure. really what matters. You can't deliver the rec recurring revenue growth without the core strength. But when, when, but when we took when, the cloud number down, when analysts are modeling the stuff out, though, you get down to a unit number, yep. and you get down to a revenue per subscriber, maintenance per subscriber, and so when those numbers come down, the, particularly when you're switching to recurring revenue uh, model, that starts to matter a lot more. Yeah, but see, the re that's that, that's here's the exciting thing, though. The revenue per subscriber on the subscriptions that matter is up 20% year over year. So what they got spooked by, and it's natural because, you know, it's a complex transition. People wonder, hey, what's sure. going on under the covers? We just said we're going to do fewer cloud subscriptions, and those cloud subscriptions aren't important to our two-year goals. Why? That's what spooked them. Because they're small relative to the core, so the cloud's growing small fast. Number or small number small in terms of revenue, revenue per customer? Small revenue number. Small revenue number. Small revenue per customer, too. Okay. But they're going to be bigger three, four, five years out. They're just small relative to the two-year goals that everybody's paying attention now, to. Now, what does it mean for sort of product development, innovation, and the kinds of things you want to innovate around? Actually, in terms of what? What we've just done with the restructure? No, I think more in terms of your investment, we're going to focus investment. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What, what it means is we're going to be investing a lot in reimagining how people do construction and manufacturing processes. You know, you know, you probably know this. Construction is the lowest invested in IT right next to agriculture in the US. I think in Europe it's actually below agriculture. Th this industry needs to be transformed and it's investing crazy in digital technologies now. So when you look forward, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be helping our construction com com customers become manufacturers of buildings. Our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, with the CEO of Autodesk there. Still ahead, Jakarta-based Gojek has its eyes on an IPO, our exclusive with the CEO and how he is fending off competition from Uber and Grab. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
This week, Lyft announced its most recent funding round has increased by 50%. That brings the total raise to $1.5 billion. The ride-hailing startup is now valued at $11.5 billion. This round was led by Alphabet, which backed Uber early on, though Uber and Alphabet's Waymo are currently embroiled in a lawsuit. Also investing is another Uber backer, Fidelity Investments. Lyft has gained significant U.S. market share this year as its main rival, Uber, faces a string of scandals and legal battles. Meantime, Gojek is facing growing competition from Grab and Uber in Southeast Asia, but its CEO isn't concerned. He says SoftBank's investment in Uber doesn't matter right now and declared 2018 as the year his company's payment platform will take off. Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann spoke with him exclusively from the year ahead Asia Summit in Jakarta and asked him about the competition. I think it is, it is one of the most uh, uh, epic and innovating battles uh, in Southeast Asia. They are incredibly, uh, uh, they're both incredible companies for us to compete with. It's an honor to compete with them, uh, with the best technology in the space of ride hailing and the largest regional kind of juggernaut with the most amount of funding. Uh, it's, an, it's an incredible challenge to have for Gojek and a big reason why Gojek got to where it is today is because we have been pushed to our limits. So we had to hyper innovate in order to adapt. Um, and we came up on top in Indonesia as a result of that competition and the, the urge and hunger to, to innovate. You mentioned that they are encroaching into a lot of your market share of as well as the services that you're providing. Does the force Gojek itself to change your strategy? No, actually, I don't think. I think our strategy was designed to be resilient against giants. So our, our, our entire product strategy, our entire uh, competitive strategy is designed around flexibility hyper diversification and mitigating risk right because we have so many different verticals that interrelate with each other it's very hard to deal with this animal called Gojek you think you're competing with us on ride hailing but actually you're competing with us on the user that uses food and ride hailing you think you're competing on food and then you realize that wait a minute this is a digital wallet player that is leveraging that uh, in order to to uh, further reinforce its food and transport business so we are a very difficult animal to guess uh, and as a result of that um, it's a little bit of that business jiu-jitsu that we have uh, that's how we survive and come up on top against the, some of the largest companies in the world your payment system you said is going to grow aggressively what are the plans for 2018 especially given the fact that this is becoming a very crowded and competitive market as well in this part of the region with the yes. likes of grab uh, lipo group as well as ascend money really diving into this right now sure sure um, just to address that point, we're actually the only large tech player in Indonesia that has a uh, uh, e-money license, right, that, at that scale, that is a pure tech player, just a pure tech player. So, so we're one of the few. And so the rest of our large players in Indonesia don't yet have an e-money license. So that's a, a, a good advantage in terms of having some lead time to further expand. So we're ahead of the curve a lot, but obviously competition will come in and we're fully expecting it and we're embracing competition because that's what makes our product great. So I think that 2018 will be the year of GoPay for Gojek. And that is when GoPay uh, acceptance uh, travels outside of our app ecosystem and starts being accepted in a variety of offline establishments, uh, in a variety of online establishments. So you're going to see 2018 as the year of partnerships. There's a very, very long queue of uh, partners that are, are trying to integrate to GoPay right now. What do you make of the investment that SoftBank has had and made on Uber? Mm -hmm. Could that lead to more consolidation in Southeast Asia? I think that for us, it is extremely important to have the integrity to pursue our product vision. And that's the only way that we're always going to be two steps ahead by beating to our own drum. So it doesn't really matter right now. We've always been the underdog in terms of funding. We've always been the underdog in terms of resource. And we've still come up on top. So it's not about how much funding you have. It's really not, it's about how hungry you are to create exceptional product experiences. That was Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann there with Gojek's CEO. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.